This is section 104 of Mark Twain's Speeches by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventieth Birthday by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Address at a dinner given by Colonel George Harvey at Delmonico's, December 5, 1905, to celebrate the 70th anniversary of Mr. Clemens' birth. Mr. Howells introduced Mr. Clemens. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and Colonel Harvey, I will try not to be greedy on your behalf in wishing the health of our honored and, in view of his great age, our revered guest. I will not say, O oh, King, live forever, but, O oh, King, live as long as you like. Amid great applause and waving of napkins, all rise and drink to Mark Twain. Well, if I made that joke, it is the best one I ever made, and it is in the prettiest language, too. I never can get quite to that height, but I appreciate that joke, and I shall remember it, and I shall use it when occasion requires. I have had a great many birthdays in my time. I remember the first one very well, and I always think of it with indignation. Everything was so crude, unesthetic, primeval. Nothing like this at all. No proper appreciative preparation made. Nothing really ready. Now, for a person born with high and delicate instincts, why, even the cradle wasn't whitewashed. Nothing ready at all. I hadn't any hair. I hadn't any teeth. I hadn't any clothes. I had to go to my first banquet just like that. Well, everybody came swarming in. It was the merest little bit of a village, hardly that, just a little hamlet in the backwoods of Missouri, where nothing ever happened, and the people were all interested, and they all came. They looked me over to see if there was anything fresh in my line. Why, nothing ever happened in that village. I, why... I was the only thing that had really happened there for months and months and months, and although I say it myself that shouldn't, I came the nearest to being a real event that had happened in that village in more than two years. Well, those people came. They came with that curiosity which is so provincial, with that frankness which also is so provincial, and they examined me all around and gave their opinion. Nobody asked them and I shouldn't have minded if anybody had paid me a compliment, but nobody did. Their opinions were all just green with prejudice, and I feel those opinions to this day. Well, I stood that as long as— Well, you know, I was born courteous, and I stood it to the limit. I stood it an hour, and then the worm turned. I was the worm. It was my turn to turn and I turned. I knew very well the strength of my position. I knew that I was the only spotlessly pure and innocent person in that whole town, and I came out and said so, and they could not say a word. It was so true. They blushed. They were embarrassed. Well, that was the first after-dinner speech I ever made. I think it was after-dinner." It's a long stretch between that first birthday speech and this one. That was my cradle song, and this is my swan song, I suppose. I am used to swan songs. I have sung them several times. This is my seventieth birthday, and I wonder if you all rise to the size of that proposition, realizing all the significance of that phrase— seventieth birthday. The seventieth birthday. It is the time of life when you arrive at a new and awful dignity, when you may throw aside the decent reserves which have oppressed you for a generation, and stand unafraid and unabashed upon your seven-terraced summit, and look down and teach, unrebuked. You can tell the world how you got there, it is what they all do. 
you shall never get tired of telling by what delicate arts and deep moralities you climbed up to that great place you will explain the process and dwell on the particulars with senile rapture i have been anxious to explain my own system this long time and now at last i have the right i have achieved my seventy years in the usual way by sticking strictly to a scheme of life which would kill anybody else it sounds like an exaggeration but that is really the common rule for attaining to old age when we examine the program of any of these garrulous old people we always find that the habits which have preserved them would have decayed us that the way of life which enabled them to live upon the property of their heirs so long as mr choate says would have put us out of commission ahead of time i will offer here as a sound maxim this that we can't reach old age by another man's road i will now teach offering my way of life to whomsoever desires to commit suicide by the scheme which has enabled me to beat the doctor and the hangman for seventy years some of the details may sound untrue but they are not i am not here to deceive i am here to teach we have no permanent habits until we are forty then we begin to harden presently they petrify then business begins since forty i have been regular about going to bed and getting up and that is one of the main things i have made it a rule to go to bed when there wasn't anybody left to sit up with and i have made it a rule to get up when i had to this has resulted in an unswerving regularity of irregularity it has saved me sound but it would injure another person in the matter of diet which is another main thing i have been persistently strict in sticking to the things which didn't agree with me until one or the other of us got the best of it until lately i got the best of it myself but last spring i stopped frolicking with mince pie after midnight up to then i had always believed it wasn't loaded for thirty years i have taken coffee and bread at eight in the morning and no bite nor sup until seven thirty in the evening eleven hours that is all right for me and is wholesome because i have never had a headache in my life but headachey people would not reach seventy comfortably by that road and they would be foolish to try it and i wish to urge upon you this which i think is wisdom that if you find you can't make seventy by any but an uncomfortable road don't you go when they take off the pullman and retire you to the rancid smoker put on your things count your checks and get out at the first way station where there's a cemetery i have made it a rule never to smoke more than one cigar at a time i have no other restriction as regards smoking i do not know just when i began to smoke i only know that it was in my father's lifetime and that i was discreet he passed from this life early in eighteen forty seven when i was a shade past eleven ever since then i have smoked publicly as an example to others and not that i care for moderation myself it has always been my rule never to smoke when asleep and never to refrain when awake it is a good rule i mean for me but some of you know quite well that it wouldn't answer for everybody that's trying to get to be seventy i smoke in bed until i have to go to sleep i wake up in the night sometimes once sometimes twice sometimes three times and i never waste any of these opportunities to smoke 
this habit is so old and dear and precious to me that i would feel as you sir would feel if you should lose the only moral you've got meaning the chairman if you've got one i am making no charges i will grant here that i have stopped smoking now and then for a few months at a time but it was not on principle it was only to show off it was to pulverize those critics who said i was a slave to my habits and couldn't break my bonds today it is all of sixty years since i began to smoke the limit i have never bought cigars with life belts around them i early found that those were too expensive for me i have always bought cheap cigars reasonably cheap at any rate sixty years ago they cost me four dollars a barrel but my taste has improved latterly and i pay seven now six or seven seven i think yes it's it's seven but that includes the barrel i often have smoking parties at my house but the people that come have always just taken the pledge i wonder why that is as for drinking i have no rule about that when the others drink i like to help otherwise i remain dry by habit and preference this dryness does not hurt me but it could easily hurt you because you are different you let it alone since i was seven years old i have seldom taken a dose of medicine and have still seldomer needed one but up to seven i lived exclusively on allopathic medicines not that i needed them for i don't think i did it was for economy my father took a drug store for a debt and it made cod liver oil cheaper than the other breakfast foods we had nine barrels of it and it lasted me seven years then i was weaned the rest of the family had to get along with rhubarb and ipecac and such things because i was the pet i was the first standard oil trust i had it all by the time the drug store was exhausted my health was established and there has never been much the matter with me since but you know very well it would be foolish for the average child to start for seventy on that basis it happened to be just the thing for me but that was merely an accident it couldn't happen again in a century i have never taken any exercise except sleeping and resting and i never intend to take any exercise is loathsome and it cannot be any benefit when you are tired and i was always tired but let another person try my way and see where he will come out i desire now to repeat and emphasize that maxim we can't reach old age by another man's road my habits protect my life but they would assassinate you i have lived a severely moral life but it would be a mistake for other people to try that or for me to recommend it very few would succeed you have to have a perfectly colossal stock of morals and you can't get them on a margin you have to have the whole thing and put them in your box morals are an acquirement like music like a foreign language like piety poker paralysis no man is born with them i wasn't myself i started poor i hadn't a single moral there is hardly a man in this house that is poorer than i was then yes i started like that the world before me not a moral in the slot not even an insurance moral i can remember the first one i ever got i can remember the landscape the weather the i can remember how everything looked it was an old moral an old second-hand moral all out of repair and didn't fit anyway but if you are careful with a thing like that and keep it in a dry place and save it for processions and chautauquas and 
world's fairs, and so on, and disinfect it now and then, and give it a fresh coat of whitewash once in a while, you will be surprised to see how well she will last, and how long she will keep sweet, or at least inoffensive. When I got that moldy old moral, she had stopped growing, because she hadn't any exercise. But I worked her hard. I worked her Sundays and all. Under this cultivation she waxed in might and stature beyond belief, and served me well, and was my pride and joy for sixty-three years. Then she got to associating with insurance presidents, and lost flesh and character, and was a sorrow to look at, and no longer competent for business. She was a great loss to me. Yet not all loss. I sold her. Ah, pathetic skeleton as she was, I sold her to Leopold, the pirate king of Belgium. He sold her to our Metropolitan Museum, and it was very glad to get her, for without a rag on, she stands fifty-seven feet long and sixteen feet high, and they think she's a brontosaur. Well, she looks it. They believe it will take nineteen geological periods to breed her match. Morals are of inestimable value, for every man is born crammed with sin microbes, and the only thing that can extirpate these sin microbes is morals. Now, you take a sterilized Christian, I mean, you take the sterilized Christian, for there's only one. Dear sir, I wish you wouldn't look at me like that. Three score years and ten. It is the scriptural statute of limitations. After that, you owe no active duties. For you the strenuous life is over. You are a time-expired man, to use Kipling's military phrase. You have served your term, well or less well, and you are mustered out. You are become an honorary member of the Republic. You are emancipated. Compulsions are not for you, nor any bugle call but lights out. You pay the time-worn duty bills if you choose, or decline if you prefer, and without prejudice, for they are not legally collectible. The previous engagement plea, which in forty years has cost you so many twinges, you can lay aside forever. On this side of the grave you will never need it again. If you shrink at thought of night and winter and the late homecoming from the banquet, and the lights and the laughter through the deserted streets, a desolation which would not remind you now, as for a generation it did, that your friends are sleeping, and you must creep in a tiptoe and not disturb them, but would only remind you that you need not tiptoe. You can never disturb them more if you shrink at thought of these things, you need only reply, Your invitation honors me and pleases me because you still keep me in your remembrance, but I am seventy, seventy, and would nestle in the chimney corner and smoke my pipe and read my book and take my rest, wishing you well in all affection, and that when you in your return shall arrive at pier number seventy you may step aboard your waiting ship with a reconciled spirit and lay your course toward the sinking sun with a contented heart end of seventieth birthday by mark twain read by john greenman and end of mark twain's speeches by mark twain